Good morning, LSA, and welcome to church. I don't know if you've been looking at your calendar lately, but Christmas is less than four weeks away, and we have a lot of things coming up. We'll be having two Christmas Eve services this year, one at 4 p.m. with childcare for ages zero to three, and one at 7 p.m. with no childcare. We are also running a can drive for the month of December and Christmas Eve. Just bring your non-perishable items and place them under the Christmas tree in the lobby. Lastly, we will be hosting Surviving the Holidays on December 6th. Here is a short video for more information. Introducing Divorce Care Surviving the Holidays, a special event that helps you make it through the holiday season after separation or divorce. Surviving the Holidays features a video that shows you how to wisely plan your holiday season. You'll also learn how to survive holiday parties, how to handle loneliness, and you'll discover how you can gradually begin enjoying the holiday season again. To learn more, talk to the Divorce Care Leader at your church and visit divorcecare.org forward slash holidays. Do you consider LSA to be your home? If so, we would love to encourage you to be all in with us. In the new year, we will be running membership and baptism courses. We're a family and we want to celebrate together. So if you're interested in becoming a member or getting baptized, please contact Deb Toth. If you have any questions or need more information, go to our website, lsachurch.net. And now, let's continue with our morning service. sing about this victory this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. 
I needed shelter, I was an orphan, and now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, and now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name, I ran. Welcome to LSA. Thanks for being here this morning, whether you're in person or online. Say hello to somebody with a socially distant wave, high five, something, some kind of welcome. Thanks for being here. We're going to continue in worship this morning. Sing about God's goodness. fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. As you are good, good.
soul. Thank you for the wonderful gifts that you give us of salvation and peace and joy. Pray that you with each and every person here and online and really every local church worshiping you this morning. We want to pray for our offering. We want to pray for Pastor Brian as he brings a word inspired by you this morning. We trust that we'll be here and we'll grow to know you more and to love you more and be more like you for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hope. This week, we light the candle of hope. Hope is a state of anticipation for something good, which is extremely healthy for us humans and is referred to frequently in the Bible. This anticipation can put us into a state of tension while we wait for whatever we are hoping for to happen. In the book of Psalms, the word wait appears over 30 times and what they are waiting upon is the Lord our God. Hope in the Bible is based on a person and that person is Jesus Christ. We choose hope when there is no indication that things will get better but know that through Jesus Christ, we can find hope in our situations. We light this candle to remember that Jesus is our living hope. Good morning. It's so good to gather for worship, to sing God's praises, and to open the word and give glory to God. Whenever that word is opened, amazing things start happening. And one of the things that we are really committed to, and you've probably seen this over the last year, we are committed to the gospel. We are committed to God's word. It is going to be preached on a regular basis. That is every single Sunday. We're going to open up that word. We're going to dive in. And here's the thing. We're not just going to read it. At LSA, we're going to live it. We are, and it's not going to be an easy, it's not an easy proposition. This is a difficult thing. This is a challenge that we have. But here's the thing. We have the Holy Spirit who is with us and is strengthening us to follow that word. On our own, we could never do it. But with the power of the Spirit, we can. And what uh, this season, as we come into uh, the December season, one of the things we're looking forward to is how that word is going to be continued to go forward. We want to see... um, people's lives transformed. And we're going to need you guys as a congregation, whether you're in person or online, we need you guys to partner with us. As we come into the end of the year, we want to uh, finish our year well financially as a way of kickstarting what's happening next year. So we've seen some really great things happen. God has got way more than you can imagine just over the horizon. But to do that, we need to partner together, and we'd ask that you'd partner with us as we uh, go forward, look at your uh, finances at the end of this year, and think about how you might partner with us in uh, glorifying God and moving forward. Our sermon series is our Advent sermon series, if you couldn't tell by the candle and the wreath. We are moving in, and we are in Advent. And our, our sermon series is called Hopeful Expectations, and the sermon, uh, the sermon title for this morning is Hopeful Energy. And the scripture we're reading, it comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. Let's read it together now. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as it twigs, as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Let us pray. 
Holy God, we read this text and we realize that you have a desire and an active waiting yourself to return. Lord, you're just waiting for the Father's say-so. Lord, to, to come and to gather us together. Lord, we just pray that we would be a church here at LSA that is actively waiting and focused on what it is that you are doing so that we can follow uh, your direction into the future. Lord, just be with us now and guide us as we enter into this uh, prophetic word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's pretty obvious to anybody that would look around that all living, plant, uh, living things, plants and animals, obviously require a constant supply of energy to function. The energy we have inside of us, in our bodies, uh, is used for all the processes that keep us alive. Some of those processes occur continually, such as with the making of things we don't even think about, like proteins and DNA and all that kind of stuff. Other processes uh, that only occur at certain times, such as when you're working out or at any time you're contracting a muscle. The special carrier of energy in our bodies is a molecule you all learned about in high school. And I am sorry if, if this causes any flashbacks uh, for any of you. It's three letters. Can anybody remember what that molecule is? I hear it, maybe. ATP. Do you guys remember that from high school bi biology? ATP works by losing this kind of phosphate group when instructed to do so by an enzyme. The reaction that happens uh, releases a lot of energy by which our bodies can build proteins, contract muscles, or in other words, you know, have the energy to wrap a present or digest that turkey. You could actually see that the ATP molecule is kind of like a battery. It stores energy when it's not needed, but is able to release it instantly when your body needs it. Now, I know what you're all thinking, especially if you're feeling a little tired even before this Christmas season starts. Where can I get some of this ATP? If you could just bottle it up and then serve it at the back of the door, I want five bottles because I'm going to need it. The truth is, it's not only the Christmas season that has us feeling a little worn out. Many of us are feeling um, the same way about the Christian life in general. Maybe you're finding it hard to get up and join in worship at church, let alone participate in the life of the church during the week. What I'd like to give you this morning, I'd like to give you a bit of a spiritual boost, a boost of energy. I'm going to be handing out some spiritual ATP bottled up in one important word, hope. Hope, from my perspective, is a mentally, physically, and spiritually focused, positive predisposition towards the future. It's the way that you look at the future. It's not just the way you look at it, it's the way you walk into it. It's, it's a positive focus and energy that you have, and you're looking forward to the future. You're engaged in it. You're not fearfully holding back and kind of being dragged into it. Rather, you're positively predisposed towards it. Hope is a gift that the Holy Spirit, of course, gives, especially when Christians are going through a tough time. That hope, as far as the uh, scripture text we're looking at this morning, has three energizing aspects that we can choose to participate in. They are ATP. This is the, the three letters that we're going to use to remember these things that we can use to energize our hope. They can energize our Christian walk. Let's get a bit of context, though, before we jump into the text. It's always good to know what is the text that's happening before? What is God doing? What is Jesus doing? In the beginning of Mark, chapter 13, it says that there's four disciples. There is Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And they're with Jesus and having some time with him alone. And they're sitting, kind of looking at the temple. And just like anyone faced with a beautiful architectural design or structure like a cathedral or a, par a parliament building, the disciples kind of comment on its beauty and the, on the, the beauty that they see there. And in response to these comments, Jesus offers some prophetic teaching. Now, this teaching doesn't seem very hopeful at first right? When you start talking about the destruction of the temple, that seems like bad news, not good news. He also talks about the difficult times that are going to follow for Christians, how difficult life is going to be, and that Christians are going to be persecuted and scattered among the nations. 
And these challenges are not only going to come from those outside the church. And I think that's what you usually think. The challenges will only come from the world outside. But in fact, Jesus says the challenges are going to come from inside as well. There are going to be people that claim to be the Messiah, that are going to save us, right? These are false messiahs. And every Christian, he says, needs to be ready to see that, be aware of that, and not be deceived by these false messiahs. This leads us to our text this morning. So all of that teaching was what leads us into what we're talking about this morning. And it leads us to our first point. Hope is assurance, there is our A, of election. Verses 24 and 25. Coming of age stories are probably one of the most popular stories in our culture. You will read these stories in books or watch them on movies. In movies, you've seen them many times. And they always start with a protagonist who's a nobody, right? Nobody cares about this person. This person is nobody. They're not special in any way. And yet due to some special situation or unique latent ability, they're chosen, it almost seems, and they come to save the day. Think of, for instance, the movie or the book, The Hunger Games, or Spider-Man, or Harry Potter. Almost any fantasy novel follows this line. The main person in the story starts out as a nobody who ends up becoming a somebody. It's almost, again, as if they're chosen. Well, in our scripture this morning, Jesus is saying it's going to look that way for Christians at the end times. It's going to look like they're nobodies, and their lives are going to be difficult, and they're going to be persecuted. And then verse 24, it says, following that distress, following that distress. In other words, some difficult times are going to happen to nobodies. There's going to be a distress for them, uh, for these Christians. The beginning of this distress is announced announced by the temple being torn down. Things are going to be bad for a time and also are before that time and also after that time. And this is exactly what happened. In AD 70, 30 some years after Jesus died, the temple was taken over by the Roman army and was destroyed. And then following, the Christians were mercilessly persecuted all over the Roman Empire, hounded from place to place until sometime in the early 300s. But losing the temple for those early Jewish Christians was really just the first sign of a new age, an age of advent, an age of hoping, an age of waiting for God to act in a decisive way. And then one day, in those days it says that follow the temple's destruction, something momentous is going to happen. It says in verses 24 and 25 that the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavenly bodies will all be affected by this coming event. Now, lots of people back then and today put a lot of trust in the stars, so it's not by accident that Jesus uses these things. Even today, uh, unfortunately, Christians even look to horoscopes or to astrology to find some sort of what they believe to be answers, which we know, of course, none of those things can actually provide. All of those things which people have put their trust in Uh, wrongly put their trust in, those massive stars, those constellations, the universe itself will start changing in the end times. Darkness and chaos will affect everything. And things will start uh, start looking like they did before creation. When they were being brought into creation, it's like things are going to start going backwards. Creation seems to begin unraveling showing that it's always been God whose will and power has been upholding the universe. It wasn't just active on its own. God was holding it, and then all of a sudden he starts to change it. John talks about these cataclysmic events in Revelation as well. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 14 says this. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned back like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So things start, uh, start looking like they're going to go back to kind of these primordial states in these end times. And at first glance, this seems like bad news. 
but it's in fact quite the opposite. In verse 26 and 27, these hard times are the herald. They're the herald of the most wonderful time of all. It says that the Son of Man, see that right here, the Son of Man will come to earth. The Son of Man is none other than Jesus Christ himself. The one we believe in by faith will no longer be hidden, no longer be veiled, but will become visible as he is. Well, during this Advent season that we're celebrating right now, we remember Jesus' first coming. When we get, and then when we get to the second coming, when the signs are happening all around us, we'll be celebrating a second Advent. Isn't that, is it going to be a strange situation? You know, we're celebrating Advent, and then to realize the, the generation that's alive at that point starting to celebrate the second Advent. They can actually see the coming of Christ. He's arriving, and they start going, we're now in this active place of waiting. But instead of the Son of Man coming in obscurity with just a few shepherds as witnesses, all people will see this coming. This coming will not be hidden from anyone, whether they have faith or not. Jesus' triumphant method of arrival is mentioned in these verses, but also a couple other different spots in Scripture. Uh, Daniel 7.13 says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And then it says again in Revelation 1.7, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now those that are mourning here in Revelation 1.7 are not Christians, but those who are not his. Those without faith uh, in that day will have to endure now eternal separation from God. There's no going back. There's no turning the, the time back and saying, no, 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 I want to make a decision now. There isn't that. There is a finality to that coming. Well, here in Mark 13, Jesus is saying that the signs of the end time should instill hope in believers. It shouldn't make us fearful. Rather, we should be hopeful. Because when he comes, he will gather his elect. It says, from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. What he is saying is, no matter where you are, no matter how you died, no matter when you died, no matter your parentage, no matter the bad decisions that you've made, there is nowhere and nothing that will stop you or stop those angels gathering you together and bringing you to Jesus. Nothing will stop him. He's coming as a king, triumphant, with full power. And you are going to feel your soul gathered unto him, and there will be great singing, and there will be great joy. This will be a Christmas season like none other. There's no better passage to bring energy to our hearts than this one that proclaims that believers have an assurance, an assurance of salvation. That assurance is yours because Jesus has already given you new life in him. He's promised you eternal life because you've repented of sin, accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and to dare, today bear the fruit of a life dedicated to him. And because of that, you can trust he will gather you to himself. Which brings us to our second point. Hope is trusting, there's the T, hope is trusting in God's word. Verses 28 and 29. If you're as old as I am, you will remember... Uh, that, team, that when team building exercises were all the rage. You will have gone on a retreat with your business or something like that, and, and when you went out on this uh, business retreat with all these other executives, you do trust building exercises, right? And one of them well, had the, the team leader to divide you up into pairs, and then he'd take one of the partners and put a blindfold on, and the other person would lead them around the obstacles in front of them, right? And this was, the idea was, if you were going to learn to trust each other to do that, maybe that would help you be a better team. In a sense, what trusting your partner did, if you trusted your partner, it energized you to follow his words and direction and touch as um, he guided you or she guided you through the obstacles. 
Jesus is kind of like that partner in a trust exercise. He's the one that can see. You're blindfolded. You have no clue what's coming. You're kind of, you know, you walk into the future one moment at a time, not knowing what the future brings. But Jesus does. Jesus can see the obstacles ahead. He is the one who can see, and he guides us uh, down a clear pathway. And so when we, uh, we turn to Jesus speaking in verse 28, we note that by his words, he is pointing out obstacles and pathways in the future that lead up to the second coming. He begins with an illustration that takes advantage of his present situation. You see, he's not only by the temple, it's springtime by the temple. And so he's looking around and he sees these fig trees. The fig tree, unlike a lot of trees in Israel, actually loses its leaves in the wintertime. And so now when the weather warms up, what happens? You know, the the tree starts to bud. The buds reveal, this beautiful tree reveals that to Jesus that summer was just around the corner. Now, unfortunately for some of us that live in the Lakeshore region, it's not a beautiful tree that reveals that warm weather is around the corner, but a fish fly. That says the warm weather is here. They get to have beautiful trees in Israel. We get fish flies in in, uh, Lakeshore. Wonderful. What Jesus is saying is that when, verse 29, these things start happening, you will know that the end is very near. It's like a warning signal from your partner. There's an obstacle coming, and there's a pathway. What are these things of verse 29? They are the events leading up to the destruction of the temple that he was talking about. Um, at the, remember, we were talking about this at the start of the sermon, uh, that the temple was going to be destroyed. However, the destruction of the temple is, more importantly, a sign of the end that Jesus has said is yet to come. The second coming, which he says is near, that is right at the door. Now, the NIV really doesn't state this very clearly. They translate a really important, it's a small word, but they translate it, I would say, even incorrectly. The ESV does a better job. It translates verse 29 as, you know that he is near. When the temple is destroyed, it is not it is near, it is he is near. You know that he is at the very gates, that he's ready, just waiting to come in. Thus, Jesus is saying that some people that are with him are going to witness the destruction of the temple, and this is going to be a signal to all future generations that Jesus now could come back at any time. Now, almost 2,000 years from that event, we've had to wait so long, we might start wondering if what Jesus said was true. Is he really coming back? You know, his prophecies came true, and the temple was destroyed, But are we sure he's going to arrive back on earth, that there is going to be a second coming? I think that Jesus would say to you, you can absolutely depend on this, on his return and the signs of his return. He says that everything in the universe, heaven and earth, the stuff that makes up creation has a lifespan. It has a a best before date. In fact, the whole universe from uh, it had a beginning and it will have an end. The end will come for everything. But the words that Jesus speaks are eternal as he is eternal. As sure as you are of the pew that you're sitting in or the couch you're sitting on in at home is real, as sure as you are that that you have two hands at the end of your arms, that they're real, as sure as you are that I am up here and speaking, as sure as you are of all these things, all those things which you engage in in the world around you, Jesus saying they are less real, they are less dependable than his words, the words of God, the Bible. The word of God, the Bible, is the most real. Get this into your head. This is going to transform your life. The Bible is the most real thing, the most substantial, the most trustworthy thing you will ever come in contact with because it is eternal. Nothing else will pass away. Even into heaven, we will remember this word because it came from the eternal one, because he is its author. If it's in the word, you can trust that it's true. And trusting in his word energizes us. 
It guides us forward. We don't look to the for a future fearfully, but we trust in God's word, and so we go into it positively, hopeful. Rather, trusting in God's word energizes us to courageously live in the world and be guided by the word around and through the obstacles that are going to come, which leads to our third and final point. Hope is preparing. There's our P. Hope is preparing for his coming. Verse 32. Some of you might know that I like to work out, but what you don't know is I like to work out early in the morning. And the reason I do that, you can probably guess, is if the kids wake up, uh, everything changes. Now, now there's everybody else needs things, and you have to help, and you're getting ready for school. So if you want to get a workout in as a parent, the thing you have to do is you have to get up before everybody else, and you have to work out. The only challenge with this is when I get up at 5.30 in the morning, the last thing I want to do is heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, and bench press. So sometimes I have to energize myself. Now, often I can do this through inner motivation and really loud music, but sometimes I need chemical support. Now, I'm not talking about drugs. Well, I am talking about a drug. It's caffeine. But not like the caffeine that you find in coffee. That's for newbies. That's for new guys. I need something way more powerful than that that early in the morning. That's when I break out something called C4. Yes, it is explosive, or powder burn, or monster, or Red Bull. You can tell that they're marketing to men here, right? With all those, you know, C4 and Red Bull. Now, everyone will probably have heard of, you may have heard of these things. What they are are really powerful energy drinks that get your heart rate going and, and get the blood pumping. Uh, Jesus' message in verses 32 to 37 are supposed to be that jolt we need to get us living the right way. The jolt is found in the words we don't know. We don't know. That is, we don't know when the end is going to come. Jesus says that even he, the Son, doesn't know when the end is going to come. The future is a mystery to all but the Father. And here is the jolt. The ramifications of not being prepared are so great that they're supposed to jolt us out of our stupor. Jesus emphasizes this theme of preparation by saying that we must be alert in verse 33 to keep watch in the verse 34 and to watch in verse 37. That's three times in six verses he says, watch. But what does it mean to be on guard, to be alert, to keep watch today? At first, you might think to keep an eye out means that we should be uh, looking for the end, that we should be watching like prophecy news or something like that. But the mini parable in verse 34 challenges the idea that we're supposed to be just sitting around looking up into the sky. Remember, uh, you, know, you know, the Holy Spirit or that Jesus says this, what are you looking up into the sky for? Go do your things, right? They're watching Jesus uh, uh, ascend and they're still there watching. No, you're not supposed to just sit here and watch the sky. Get out and do. The disciples keep watch by doing the things that they were assigned to do. We've all been tasked with different things to do. We are all supposed to contribute to the life of the church. And we're supposed to be doing and participating in the life of the Christian community. If we're not doing what we are assigned to do, no matter how much prophecy news you're watching, you're not really watching. You're not keeping watch. Everyone has been given a task. That task doesn't need to be flashy or showy. It can be behind the scenes. It can be in sacrificial giving. It can be offering care, care support to those that are in a hospital or in a nursing home or, or just have a need. It can be, all the, on the other hand, more up front. It can be leading music, teaching, welcoming people to the church, leading a group, whatever. The main point is that watching is not a passive activity, but an active one. What we should all want when Jesus returns, which is going to be very soon, is not finding us twiddling our thumbs but making a difference here, doing the things we're called to do. The last thing we would want, verses 35 to 37, is for him to find us sleeping, doing nothing. Back in Jesus' day, if a soldier was given the responsibility of guarding the fort, it was an important responsibility. If a soldier fell asleep at night, he might even be executed. But at minimum, the soldiers that he served with would send the guy a message. 
Anybody that knows anything about soldiers know that they have a dark sense of humor and can send a message better than anyone else. If a fellow soldier could not stay awake, they'd help him out. Back in the day, if your buddies found you asleep on guard duty, they would take a flame and light your clothes on fire. The important point that Jesus is trying to make here is when he returns, knowing that he's going to return should light us up. It should energize our hope, keeping us awake, knowing that his arrival could be any minute of any day, even now. Friends, what we've learned this morning is that hope is something we all need, especially in these very busy, difficult times. Our hope is not the same as those in the Old Testament who look forward to a Messiah because the Messiah has already come and saved us. What we look forward to now, what we hope for, is the second coming of Jesus. The difficulty is, is that it's taking a long time to come, and we wonder when it will happen, and sometimes in our dark days, wonder if it will ever happen. Jesus' message to us this morning is that we need to energize our hope with a bit of ATP. We need to have assurance that we are elected by God, chosen by Him, and will be gathered in, to Him when He returns. We need to trust that all the words of the Bible are true, and that even now we need to prepare for His coming, actively engaging in the tasks that He's given us to do as part of our a church, part of a Christian community. With such energized hope, let us lean into the Christmas season, remembering that we believers ultimately hope in, not in what we can see, but what is unseen, but will soon be revealed. Jesus coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Let us pray. Holy God, we are so thankful for the word that you have given us today. It is a word of hope. Lord, be with us and help us to find that assurance that you are going to gather us in those end days. Lord, that your word is true. Lord, that if we just continue to prepare, you will be honored and glorified. Lord, for all of us who are still looking for a little bit of energy in this season, help us to find it in hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
that endureth thine own dear pleasure to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand a little down or depressed, you're feeling a lack of energy, I want you to energize your hope by getting a bit of ATP, right? And have that assurance of your election. God has saved you. To be able to have trust in God's word, what he says is true and is true eternally. And you need to prepare. Start preparing for that return. This will energize you. Now, if you want more prayer, if you'd like to pray uh, for your family, you would like to pray a little bit more about that energy or talk more about it, I would encourage you to go to our family room right after the service, and there's a number of people ready to pray with you there. If you are online and you are wanting prayer, there are prayer cards that you can find in our, on our website. Fill them out and let us care for you. Amen. Till I'm 